My name is Brenna simmons Ange. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit based in Denver, Colorado called the Alliance Center. We were founded in 2004 with the simple and powerful purpose to bring people together to identify and advance solutions for a thriving planet. We've been at that in Colorado for almost 20 years, and as we expand our scope and grow nationally in 2023, we'll soon be known as the Alliance for Collective Action. And that is because we represent collective action for a thriving planet. We focus on uniting the collective power of environmental and social movements so that together we can identify and advance solutions for a regenerative world. And that is our dream a regenerative world where people and planet are treated with love, dignity, and respect. I introduced a word today, regenerative, that many of you have known for decades and could probably be up here schooling me on what regenerative is. Others, maybe you're just now learning it, or maybe you've heard it kicked around a few times in different meetings and are too shy to ask what it is, or a little bit confused because some of us are just starting to understand what sustainability is, and now it might feel like we're moving the goalpost. Well, I want to demystify that for you just a little bit. Regenerative and sustainability are not synonymous. They don't mean the same thing. But when handled the right way can actually be a really powerful partnership for advancing solutions. So sustainability really means balance. It's where your inputs meet your outputs. And hopefully, if done right, we can sustain systems into perpetuity. But if we're trying to sustain broken systems or systems that are exploitive or extractive, we can only sustain them for so long until we start to experience collapse. And the signs of collapse are all around us. Now, regeneration means to heal. It means to renew, to restore, to refresh, to make better, to make stronger not to find balance where your inputs meet your outputs. But once we're able to heal a broken system and regenerate it, then we want to sustain regeneration as we are constantly evolving to meet the needs of the current day and age. Bodies are naturally regenerative. Humans are of nature. We are animals. We are just highly evolved animals. And so as part of nature, our bodies are naturally regenerative for. If you remember when you were a kid and you fell down and scraped your knee, or if your young children have uh, scrapes on them now, their skin is healing, it's regenerating. And where that scab is growing over, it might be stiff and itchy and ugly and unsightly and um, kind of messy until that new scab falls off and the new skin is growing up and you can see the beauty of regeneration coming through your very own body. The natural world's regenerative as well. When a forest fire burns, that fire is devastating and violent and destructive. And afterwards, the forest regenerates and there's more diversity in the burn areas than there were before. The soil has more nutrients in it and the bioavailability can return to the regions when nature is left to heal itself. Uh, just like a lizard losing its tail, it'll grow it back, or a starfish losing its limb will grow it back. Nature, when not interrupted by human developed systems, is naturally regenerative and healing. So too are our bodies. Now, after that uh, first agriculture revolution about 10,000 years ago, we experienced a series of other big milestones for humanity. Every few hundred years, there was another major age from the agricultural revolution to the scientific revolution, where we started to break everything down into its smallest parts and study it in pieces. But we forgot to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We analyzed Humpty Dumpty's broken shell while we dissected it through science in every small little piece. But how do all those small little pieces build back up to one huge, large living ecosystem on planet Earth and in the greater cosmos in which we fit? After the scientific revolution was the industrial revolution. And that was really the kickstart of climate change as we know it, when our consumption as humanity started to outpace what the world can provide. And then we went into the technological revolution where we are commuting today on screens all across the world. Now, don't get me wrong, because each and every one of these major revolutions and evolutions enabled leaps and bounds for the evolution of consciousness and humanity and the luxuries we enjoy today. And every single one of them furthered the wedge of separation of humanity from nature, of man from woman, of me from you, of one race against another. And we have continued down that journey of separation in somewhat of an unconscious manner. 
And now humanity is waking up all across the globe and finding ways that we can truly have a fundamental philosophical shift into the age of regeneration. And we are here today to share with you more about the important role that agriculture and specifically the health of our soils has in not just combating climate change, but in helping redesign and rebuild all the systems that govern our lives in the time frame that we have here to extend the human experiment on planet Earth. So now I'd like to share with you just a little bit about what the Alliance for Collective Action does to actualize our lofty and very ambitious vision for a regenerative world. We have two main program areas. The first is the center, which we've been running since 2004, and it's a 40,000 square foot aired space. So it's a collaborative working environment that supports about 160 other organizations through tenancy and events to do their work better and faster and with more positive collective action than they could have alone. And we're more than just the landlord. We are the connective tissue between our tenants, connecting them together to decision makers, to funding and to solutions that can scale. We also have the coalition. Now the coalition was built in response to the pandemic. It's called the Coalition for a Regenerative Future. Right now it represents over 400 members all across the state of Colorado from all walks of life and all sectors who boldly work together to identify vision and then implement projects that can start to create a regenerative economy and society right here in Colorado while advancing equitable climate solutions at speed and at scale. So those four projects, first and foremost, are looking at the rapid transition to renewable energy through an economic lens, while simultaneously sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere through regenerative ag and soil health. Then we also have and are building a robust workforce development training program to support both of those sectors to upskill and reskill the workforce into the clean energy economy and clean tech and renewable energy, and then also into regenerative agriculture, prioritizing soil health through our working lands. And then lastly, we put a nice bow around that package with an annual policy platform where we crowdsource policy ideas from the unusual suspects and elevate them to Colorado lawmakers coded to stimulus funding from the state and federal government. So in 2023, our policy platform is actually coded to where IRA funding can help implement the ideas that the coalition is advancing. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I'm really excited and honored to share more about our work in regenerative agriculture, which is not only helping to restore the carbon cycle and sequester carbon from the atmosphere back into the ground, it's also helping to provide more economic viability for our working lands, rural communities, our agriculture producers all across the state of, of Colorado, while creating a community of practice and a movement of people who are so passionate about the food they eat, the health of the soils and the health of their communities. This model is relevant anywhere in the world, and we are honored and thrilled to work with our partners who you'll hear from in implementing this project in Colorado and building wings for national expansion in 2023, grounded in the healthy soils in Colorado. Thank you so much and have a lovely day. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction to our work, Brenna. Hi, my name is Jolie Bronner, and I'm the director of the Coalition for a Regenerative Future for the Alliance Center in Denver, Colorado. As I keep exploring the world of regenerative agriculture, the more hope I seem to find, and that's something we need right now in abundance, is more hope. Yes, we need to reduce our use of fossil fuels massively and justly, and we need to rethink our degenerative systems and structures holistically. But our soil, whether in our farms, parks, open spaces, or even right in your own backyard, has an incredible capacity to absorb carbon right out of our atmosphere. As we explore a societal shift to greener energy and the electrification of everything, we can also shift to healthier ways of treating our soils, not just making them more productive, but carbon capturing. So really understanding the importance of our soil health is key to understanding how best to address climate change. So what exactly is regenerative farming? As Brenna just taught us, regeneration equals healing. And while different farmers define regeneration in different ways, it all comes back to healing. Regenerative producers think of soil as a partner, a living thing that needs attention, respect, and love. So they don't throw toxic chemicals on it. 
they don't beat it down with overgrazing. They embrace farming practices that rebuild all that good stuff in the soil. So join me today as we meet three of our Colorado partners and we explore the roots of healthy soil, ultimately honoring the legacy of indigenous soil stewards who knew how important it was to work with the land as an extension of themselves and discuss how reconnecting to the earth is the first step to understanding the climate healing power right beneath our feet. First, we're going to speak with Clark Harshberger, Director of Stewardship for Mad Agriculture in Boulder, Colorado. Mad Agriculture is working to catalyze a revolution in agriculture at the global scale. However, they understand that it must start from the ground up with the soil and it must be regenerative. Let's hear from Clark now. I spent about 17 years with the USDA as a soil scientist. Um, I've looked at soils in just about every cropping system that the United States um, that we, we raise. I haven't done fisheries or anything like that, but uh, anything on the land uh, from vineyards to orchards to wheat, small grain to market gardens like the ones we just visited. And then of course livestock, whether it be on rangeland or pasture land. So I did that for about, I could say, 17 years or so. Um, my last position with the government was as a soil health um, kind of specialist or resource soil scientist in Greeley, Colorado, uh, and that's in Weld County, which at that time was the 10th largest agricultural producing county in the United States of America. So like it's the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, a lot of big industrial agriculture, agriculture that uh, feeds a lot of people. It's uh, very critical for our society to run with that type of agriculture as we speak, but it also, um, is very demanding on the natural resources such as water and soils and then displacing some of the the voiceless like i like to say the underground voiceless um, the microbes and micropopulations and of course uh, the mammalians and the birds and the insects and things that start to decline when we do um, monoculture type of agriculture also i was not no, not necessarily brainwashed but reduced to a way of thinking so i could do a very efficient job and this movement, um, you really have to put that type of thinking to rest. And so when I left the government, I really tried to intentionally kill, for lack of a better word, the soil scientist in me and become a steward. And I think with that conversation, I now can even advocate for the soils just as much. But I know every time I say soils, I'm thinking, oh, microbes. I'm thinking, oh, plants. I'm thinking, oh, air. I'm thinking oxygen. I'm thinking water. I'm thinking humans, I'm thinking animals, I'm thinking earth, I'm thinking Africa, and all of those inner things connected and holding those complexities is super critical. So then when you go to actually talk about soil, you can think about all the other things that your decision making affects when you're managing the soil as a resource and all the things that you can use as tools um, to actually work within it and know its limitations and know um, its possibilities. But at the same time, everybody's expression of how they manage their soil is just that. And each person is doing probably the best they can. And so when we come with ideas, we want to make sure that the ideas can build capacity and a deeper understanding of how they can change that into action to help support their vision. Um, and so I just want to call that out because Damien Soil Health versus Rangeland Soil Health versus um, conventional agriculture soil health, it can manifest and, and look different ways in the pocketbook and in the land. But we truly believe that these principles, which are indigenous uh, natural principles, there's no one that can claim the principles of soil health. Gabe Brown might try to sell a book on it or Ray Archuleta who worked for the NRCS who I learned from might try to claim it. But these are deeper, older things that are happening in natural systems that we're just kind of wrapping our minds around and then reflecting them back into the agricultural system. So. These aren't my ideas. These aren't anyone from the USDA's or CDA or anybody. These are concepts of ecology that have existed for as long as we've been able to observe it and understand it, and then much longer even before that. So I'm Clark Harshbarger with Matt Agriculture. I'm the Director of Stewardship, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about soil. Thanks so much for speaking with us today, Clark. Can you tell us why is healthy soil so important? An amazing question. Um, I've spent quite a bit of my life trying to understand it. And I think one of the greatest things about healthy soil is that there's always for, uh, going to be a lot for us to keep and continue learning. And so healthy soil um, 
is something that we've really started to frame um, with new language in the last couple decades. Um, I would say is even at the turn of the century, we were using terms like soil quality to describe healthy soil. And a lot of times that was, you know, based on what the science was trying to understand about what to measure. And I think what really shifted my view on soil quality to soil health was actually that there are things that we can measure scientifically. And I think there's a lot of things that are immeasurable. Um, and I mean that just like a feeling might be immeasurable, um, a, a type of smell or a, a way that a soil makes you feel when you hold it, whether it's cold or warm or moist or dry. And so I think a lot of our senses are actually really attuning our hearts and our minds and our spirits to what soil health is. And then the beauty of that is technology is also moving forward with um, quantifying what healthy soil is. And so there is really great supportive science that can basically support what we already know to be true. So what does it mean to be a steward of the soil? Just picking up off some of those concepts, I think it's for caring for things that we can't see. Um, and, and some of those things, like I said, are microscopic, but it's also using plants to heal the soil. And we use plants um, to take care of one each other. So that's like referred to as companion planting. Um, polyculture is the way native prairie existed. They had cool season and warm season grasses, legumes, sometimes even shrubs in the prairie or even um, small trees. And so I think being a steward of the soil is really understanding that each plant has a role to play. Um, and whether that role is to provide energy for us, um, like through corn, or through wheat or through potatoes, or it's also to provide energy to the things in the soil that are gonna help us care for those crops. So I think stewarding the soil is really understanding that there's um, a whole group of things that are dependent on the way we understand those relationships. And so the more we understand about our soil and those relationships and the interconnectedness of them, will our souls will reflect that in our management They'll become darker, they'll become better at holding water, they'll be better at moving water throughout into deeper layers. Um, they'll start to smell more fragrant. Um, they will actually be regulated in temperature. Um, and so the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature will stay closer together because typically they'll have uh, living plant canopies on them or they'll have residues. And so it makes a more stable environment. Um, for the organisms that live in soils. And so it's also about giving back. And one of my favorite indigenous quotes um, that I learned when I used to work in Texas was that the cultures that lived here on this continent before us were givers and not takers. And they gave more than they took to the soil. And that's really when I learned, relearned some of that, that I, that I think I may have had an intuition about, but I wasn't practicing in the way I managed soils. Um, that really gave me the opportunity to reimagine and rethink about what we can do to be stewards in the soils. And that's giving a row to the land and then moving that row over in succession, maybe it's in three or four seasons, but it's an intention that that land needs the plant's energy, just like we need the plant's energy below ground and above ground. So I think that's really important to think about as a steward is that we are taking, but we also have to really be giving back. How can healthy soil help us as we face the climate crisis? I think it helps us because we begin to think about a new paradigm. Um, and so the paradigm starts with healthy soil for many of us in the regenerative agricultural movement, but it has to also go beyond just the soil. It goes to our behaviors. Um, and one thing that help us change our behaviors is basically uh, continuing to learn. Uh, and the more we learn and we understand cause and effect of the choices that we're making, um, it can really reflect back on our health of the environment that surrounds us. Many of our lands are um, in some form of degradation. And so that degraded land, as it's cared for, will start to heal and start to increase its function. Um, it will increase its water cycle ability. That means 
the ability not just to receive water, but to hold it. Um, it will also um, be able to cool the earth's surface um, when we have vegetation growing um, and continuous vegetation. And one of the principles of soil health is the living root. So the longer that we can keep um, plants living in our agricultural fields, um, the more it will be able to absorb the sunlight um, and the, the chlorophyll and the green plant tissue um, helps reduce some of the heat that actually comes down onto the earth. And so a bare earth um, will tend to heat up faster. And so I think being a steward of the soil and a steward of the land and bringing all of those concepts into your type of agriculture will allow um, the earth the opportunity to be able to exist as it once did before the dawn of civilizations. And I think that's a paradigm that, you know, what do we want the earth to be in 500 years from now, or even a thousand years from now? is something that we need to think about, but we also need to consider what is it going to be like for the next generation. Thanks so much for that perspective, Clark. Super valuable. But how can individuals support healthy soil in their own homes and communities? Can you be a steward of the soil in your own backyard? Everyone has the ability to follow the principles of soil health. Um, you know, we're trying to keep a living root. We're trying to minimize our disturbance and that's physical, chemical and biological. We're trying to armor the soil with residues and protect it. And we're trying to incorporate diversity in what we're raising and what we're growing and what's living on the properties that we have our homes and our dwellings on. Um, and then I think one of the last part principles and maybe a little bit trickier for some of us to integrate is some type of fertility cycle from our animals. Um, so some of that is happening, um, you know, if you have a backyard chicken, but you can always bring in some manures that have been basically stabilized through the composting process from livestock. And so that's a really great way to do that. And uh, I think the most important thing, um, I don't think it necessarily has to be a vegetable garden, but to grow something, um, you know, plants fix dirt. Um, and that was said by Dr. Haney um, and their team uh, when they first brought in how we started testing about soil health. And they said, let's make this simple. Plants fix dirt. So the plant will take the energy from the sun and put that back into the soil and it will start to create air spaces and create food sources uh, in the form of simple sugars and those will feed the microbes and then the microbes will in turn feed each other and start to create these fertility and beautiful habitats um, that are basically integrated with small and large and, and, and air and water and all these amazing interfaces of the different elements on the earth. And we, as people that live, um, you know, whether we live in the urban environment or we live in a, in, with a school garden, um, we can plant seeds. And then with following these principles and making sure we provide adequate sun and water, um, the, the plants will do the work. They will heal the soil and they will start to create um, a, a beautiful change um, an environment from going from something that maybe had one or two things growing in it to a multitude. Um, and like we like to say, there's, you know, many beautiful flowers and colors in the gardens. And I think if you take on that as a, as a global citizen and try to make that manifest um, in your surroundings, I think we're all going to really benefit. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with us, Clark. It was really interesting to hear all about your journey from just soil scientist to true soil steward. In the same vein, next, we're going to be meeting with two members from Harvest of All First Nations, Andrea Yoloteo Chanchewe Nawaje and Beverly Castaneda. They both represent Harvest of All First Nations, which Harvest of All First Nations is an indigenous-led collaborative empowering communities through projects and education. But I'm going to let you learn some more about Harvest of All First Nations directly from Andrea, who will be joining us shortly. First, we're going to start with some on-site footage of Andrea leading a tour through the Hoffman Indigenous Garden at Yellow Barn Farm in Boulder, Colorado. Next, Andrea will join us with a land acknowledgement, recognizing indigenous cultures past, present, and who still share the land with us They're today. Beverly and Andrea, as they have a conversation about the importance of healthy soil and its deep roots in indigenous knowledge and wisdom. Let's join them now. 
a regenerative way is just a way that the Western society has found to name what it was actually indigenous knowledge, what we actually did and still do, you know, and that we know by generations on how to take care of the land. For example, here, our intentions of planting here this place and regenerate the land is to bring people back to the roots and bring people back to really make connection to what really is important to us and is going to sustain us. The way that we are planting here is in a mix of a Western way and also an indigenous way by planting the three sisters that we have here that work beautifully in the human world because they feed us and because they help us when we plant them like this together and they help the soil with the carbon sequestration and also the, nit the uh, nit nitrogen fixation. And they fix the soil in the same way that they can produce food that we get from all of these three elements together or three, these three, sis three, three sisters together for us to get what we need. When we cultivate in this way and we cook in the ancestral way, we are able to obtain vitamins like B12, calcium, protein from the beans. And this is what the reason us, for us as indigenous people, corn is one of the main plants for us because it has supported us for thousands of years. And it not only has supported us in this turtle island as we know it to be, right? That is all this like continent, but it's also going from the Patagonia all the way down up to Alaska. If we continue to be disconnected from the land, we're not gonna care enough to change it. We're not gonna care enough to be able to just, you know, create movements that are gonna change the systems that, of oppression that we live in. So the reason why I gave you all some tobacco is for you to honor this land that you're in right now. It's an offering for you as recognition of that you're honoring the people that was massacred on these lands. So I encourage you to put a little thought, a little prayer when you put this tobacco down for this movement, for us as people to be able to really care for the land in union. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Yolteo Chanchi with Nawaje. Um, I am from the Aztec nations and I want to uh, say that, you know, I, I want to honor first the ancestors of this land that are making possible for us to continue to do in this work and to raise awareness and to to advocate for the land, to advocate for the earth that is the one that's giving us sustainability and is giving us everything that we need to continue here. I want to acknowledge in that way too, all the nations that have been in this land, especially of Colorado, and that we are still continuing here on this land in a presence, you know, in presence for our indigenous people. They are Apaho, the Cheyenne, the Shoshone, the Aztec people, the Ute, and all the other 48 nations that used to call, um, congregate here and still congregate here, and we are still here making presence. So I want to acknowledge all of that and giving thanks for this opportunity to speak um, on behalf of Mother Earth, who is the one that is uh, hosting us at this moment. I am the Chief Executive Director and Founder of Harvest of All First Nations. Harvest of All First Nations is focused on an Indigenous-led collaboration empowering communities through projects and education. We are um, an Indigenous organization, led organization, and our mission is to create uh, reparations, create rematriation and earth-based decolonization for the benefit of BIPOC plus communities for the cultural, educational and health equity. Harvest of All First Nations is a grassroots community-based organization guided by the Council of Leaders creating change in BIPOC plus communities and on underserved communities in the Denver Boulder Front Range area and beyond. With that said, you know, uh, please consider to support our programs by going to the halfandco.org um, and help us to reach our goals um, in order to continue serving the communities that are have been marginalized for so long and also uh, to for us to continue to revitalize the earth in a good way.
you know, our um, dear sister and, um, you know, indigenous relations consultant, Beverly Castaneda, is here to help us to understand more about indigenous knowledge that we carry and that has been carried through uh, our generations, through our blood, through our, you know, consciousness as indigenous people in relation to the land. So um, we're here to answer some of the questions of how traditional ecological knowledge may work and how our science, which is indigenous science, can actually help us to be back in regenerative practices and help us to actually be back into, uh, be in connection to listen to the land. Thank you so much for joining us today to share your perspective and knowledge. Can you start by speaking about why healthy soil is important? Because soil is like if it was part of our body, you know, the soil that we have is in relation to the land and it's like, in, in our indigenous thinking, it's like if it's our our body, the the skin, the the meat, that everything that we carry with. But not only that, like it's the one that is going to give the nutrients, as we probably know, right, to all our food systems and the relation that we create with it. Not forgetting that, like water, is the one that is going to be feeding all those microbiomes in order for us to continue remembering and reconnecting to her. Thank you, Yolo. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and I really love working with you and Hafen. And I'm really honored to be here in this space where we get to talk about what we love the most and that is being with the Mother Earth, the land. And thank you for the land acknowledgement. Really appreciate you speaking about our first, um, first Nation ancestors who walked these lands. Um, to acknowledge them, we, we acknowledge them to bring healing to them and to let them know that we are continuing to do the work that they had left off. And that it's about bringing healing to the land, bringing healing to our bodies and um, reconnecting our indigenuity to the land. So that the land is healing from all of the massacres and bloodshed that has been shed here on these lands. So that's why we do the work that we do. And to have healthy soil is, is helping us to reconnect to our ecosystem that we have in our body and the ecosystem to the land. So that helps us to understand the, the minerals, the microbiome, and it's also how Mother Earth keeps an eye on us. Like there's so many different interconnections and webs, you know, and weaving that Mother Earth does. And, you know, it's just part of the indigenous knowledge that we walk with to share people to reconnect to the land because, you know, there's a lot of chaos that's going on, but it's there to reconnect us to what balance and harmony and unity is in our life. To both of you, what does it mean to be a steward of the soil? What does it mean to be a steward of the soil? The land. The... This means that, first of all, we have to check our ego. And uh, science has done a really good job of saying, you know, I'm going to come in and do this, do that, do this. And when we're working with the land from our indigenous perspective and our indigenous teachings and knowledge, we are looking at what is there and how is the land speaking to us. So it's in the observation and contemplation where we look at the land to see what the land needs before we think about our needs. And this is respecto. It takes a lot of time and practice to be able to see the habitat and the livelihood that is there. So this means that when we're working with the soil and working with the land, that we want to ask for permission to we offer food, we offer prayer so that we can learn from them, learn from them and share the land with them so that we're not disrupting any uh, livelihood that's there. Mm -hmm. But it also, um, thank you, Beverly, um, for reminding us that in addition to the fact that when we become stewards of the land, we become advocates for the land. We become the ones that are going to be speaking on behalf of the ones that cannot speak, like the plants, the trees, the ones that cannot like defend themselves from all the atrocities that we are doing as human beings to her at the moment. We must remember that the land is a living being. The earth is the, a living being that carries that memory and that carries that home feeling, right? That we that that we, that we like um, long for so much. And reason why so many studies, right? Like so many studies now are talking about 
you know, oh, when you're gardening, you depression gets better. When you're gardening, you may be, you know, suffering yourself. When you are like closer to the land, how many of us we have gone just for a hike with the principles of um, eco psychology, right? In order for us to get in the right mindset. Why? Because we need to understand that everything that is within us is without, within her as well. And when we reconnect through her, then we are able to actually understand and like Beverly is saying hear what like she wants to say that is um us being advocates for everything that cannot speak well that was really beautiful and I appreciate your words because I could feel it coming from your heart but it's also the oneness that the land and the cosmos and the universe work together and working in that oneness like not being separate from that and how do we show up to be in the oneness of that like is it always about the product is it always about the progress or is it about, you know, the, uh, the humility and the humbleness that it brings to our lives and their livelihood, to their livelihood and our lives? Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Can you maybe tell us more about how healthy soil can help us as we face the climate crisis? The climate crisis that we have um, produced, you know, as human beings, um, has an impact, of course, on the next generations, but not only the human generations, but also all the other gen living things generationally, correct? So there's so many animals that have been extinct that are dysregulating a lot of the ecosystems. There's so many plants that also are extinct or that, you know, plants were, uh, have been invading other areas too, where it causes a lot of changes on the natural pH of the soil. And the reason why one of our focuses is also to push for rematriation of the land. Why soil, soil health is so important on that? Because just as soil we, we and water, they work together in order for us to be able to continue to provide life, really, you know, water, Yes, is one of our main things, as we said in indigenous ways, right? Water is life and water is the giver of everything. And we wouldn't be able to be here without her. And yet, without the soil, we wouldn't be able to eat as people, neither. We wouldn't be able to get all the minerals and the nutrients that we need from her, along with the mycelium, where I will let my sister Beverly speak more about that, you know, like in order for us to actually remembering and connecting, you know, of um, how to even grow our food. We have forgotten because of science and because the Western world on how to listen to the plants carefully and to learn from there directly. We think that based on the books and in a science book on what the science have found we know everything that the plant has uh, given us when in reality if we go and we develop that relationship with the plants we might find out that like the things that science are saying how to grow this how to grow that how permaculture supposed to be these days right is the right way or like you know like the the way that you're supposed to be doing things you know we we can get so closed off into those paradigms that we forget to listen to ourselves and to reconnect with what the plant is really telling us and what the plant can give us as a gift and what like you know the soil by itself can give us as a gift the soil is essential to have a good climate um, the climate. Why? Because if we have healthy soil, we will be able to have the right carbon sequestration, the right nitro nitrogen fixer, right? The right nutrients that we need in order to create the balance among the ecosystems and all the microsystems that exist within it. Because the soil is not only, you know, dirt, which it could be called, but it's a lot of just bacteria living bacteria where if you think about it a lot of our bodies have gone there a lot of the bodies of our ancestors have gone there and this is why the relationship between the indigenous people and us too with this land particularly is so strong because our blood has been offered on the land and so it has mixed with our dna Sister as well. mm -hmm. so you know i agree with everything that you said which is really beautiful thank you um well with the mycelium and the natural resources that have their had their livelihood here, 
we've done a good job. And I say we because we're part of the system. We are part of the, the change that is taking place. We have to admit that, you know, we have we are choosing to be advocates to bring back the buffalo, bring back the mycelium so that the ecosystem of the Mother Earth can be healthy and provide the nutrients that we need in the soils. But we have to understand we as being good Samaritans cleaning up our backyards, cleaning up all of their livelihood, we're destroying them. We have to be able to take a look at ourselves and see what we've been adding to it to change the system. So the mycelium has a good way of coming in and restoring and taking all of the toxins, taking um, all of the things that we put into the soil like chemicals so that it can go in and support the trees, the roots, their system, because without the soil, we're not going to exist. And how are we going to grow our natural foods if if um, we as people, as a sovereign nation, don't start standing up and saying, look, this isn't working for us anymore. And the environment is already showing us this. Do what the animals do. We can't do what the mycelium does. We are the people who are supposed to be the protectors of these. And we've done a good job of just doing what the um, capitalism wants us to do. But we as indigenous and sovereign people need to start stepping up and saying, no, we need to bring the animals back. They are, they are the kingdom to me, like that they, they are more powerful than we as people could ever be. And um, I, we're learning to honor the animals again and to, you know, look at them not just as a species, but as a spirit, as a beautiful spirit that is our teachers that'll teach us how to revive and bring back the balance to Mother Earth. Can you both tell us some more about how individuals can support healthy soil in their own homes and communities? Oh, um, thank you so much. We forget that um, oftentimes, you know, we we try to go out and I want to refer to a phrase that uh, my colleague Ian Sanderson, you know, taught me, um, you know, where is um, we forget and we always think, you know, oh, I want to go outside in nature. And we forget that sometimes nature is just in a pot of a plant that we can have right there. And that the connection is right there. You know, the connection is right there when you're drinking a cup of water. The connection is right there when you are, you know, just like breathing the air that you're breathing. And that you may not forget that the connection is right there. Where they, you know, there's a method that one of our farm mentors is also implementing, um, Yvette Larrea, and she knows, you know, about how to, she says that, you know, oh, I want to, share with people how it's to do lazy gardening, right? What lazy gardening is, why? Because our communities that we're trying to impact are the ones that have been oppressed, the ones that don't have time to be gardening, the ones that don't have the privilege to go by the seeds, the ones that don't have sometimes the privilege to have good soil or good water. To remember one of the things that, um, you know, was very evident through indigenous science uh, at the last previous um, garden that we had, um, with one of our collaborators at Yellow Barn for the corn festival and everything, we actually, you know, planted the corn and the three sisters there uh, for, you know, with a prayer, with an intention. And other corn was planted also on the side at the same time that it was, you know, with us, but without the prayer and without the intention and without the offering. Our corn was able to grow almost seven feet tall. And the other corn was like about four feet tall or something like that that grew or five feet tall at the most, which is teaching you and showing you the relationship that we have with the power of prayer. And I'm not talking about a religious prayer, but an intention, a thought, a song. We sing to our seeds, we sing to our soil, we pray, we talk to them, we treat them as living beings. And the difference and the impact that you may have, that you can, you know, regenerate and cre create with that soil is huge. Because why? Because like the, remember, remember once again, the water carries, the, the soil carries the water and the water has the, the, the soil is so vital in our life, like the soil and the animals and the habitat. And I, I cannot talk about the soil and separate the animals from the soil and not separate the, the star nations that come here to be born to teach us how to live on this beautiful planet who constantly gives itself to us. So I feel as people, we have a responsibility 
to understand that the land is a living spirit and when we're connecting with the land it, it teaches us how to be as people period like how how do we navigate all this anger and frustration and the separation of of this dominant superiority of of how to live so i feel like we as a nation of people when we take off our shoes and we walk on the land and we start to receive calmness we start to receive peace and we start to have mental clarity and new perspectives or new possibilities why wouldn't you want to connect with the land why wouldn't we go to the land to receive these types of teachings because we as as people we need help and if we're not able to look in our own backyards and see that we're already giving everything that we need and then how do we keep its livelihood alive like there is you know there's responsibility in that so that that's just kind of my feeling about it and um i know that we want to grow our own food and be able to have access to it to healthy good food and the only way we're going to understand our own body system is if we do grow the foods that we need so that the land can teach us what we need in our ecosystem and our body that we carry and that's kind of like what i'm going through right now um so the land is a teacher the soil is going to be our teacher and we're all indigenous to these lands and to the teachings well we're indigenous to the land so i just feel like we reconnect with our ancestral knowledge through being with the soil by being with the soil and allowing ourselves to get dirty and messy like that's part of the chaos in being with the soil and that's why you know i'm an advocate that don't clean your backyard leave it messy <laughs> because there's other life that needs those resources and we've been taking those resources away from it. we've been taking the resources away because we feel like in society it says that we have to have a clean backyard and that's backwards we don't they need that protection and they need us to advocate for them for that protection Wow, what an incredible conversation about the roots of soil health, soil science, and the shift to soil stewardship. Thank you so much to both Andrea and Beverly with Harvest of All First Nations for sharing their wisdom and knowledge with us today. And finally, we're headed over to Dry Labs Agroecology Research, or DAR, in Longmont, Colorado, to see this practice of soil stewardship in action. DAR's vision is to transform dry, abandoned, and marginalized landscapes into lush ecosystems where humans, animals, and spirit can thrive. Dedicated to revitalizing ecosystems across the globe, co-executive directors Nick DiDomenico and Marissa Polensky are listening to the needs of their immediate community and Earth herself. DAR has become an unlikely reality in the dry foothills of the Rocky Mountains and continues to focus on researching and documenting how it truly is possible to create abundance where there may be little to no water or hope. Let's join Nick and Marissa on site at DAR's Elk Run Farm as they tell us more about how they're working with their land to produce an abundance of food and even more incredibly, an abundance when I first moved to this property in 2015, this whole area where our grains are now growing looked just like the driveway here. It was just a road base. There had been asphalt scraped off of it. Somebody had been parking heavy machinery here. And I had first gotten pigs that year and I thought to myself, this was the only place on the property I could not imagine degrading any further with livestock. You know, as we know that depending on how you manage livestock, they can work for good or, or do harm to the land too. And so I kept three pigs in this area and as I started watching how they worked the land, I would put more bedding, more straw and hay and wood chips and even sometimes horse manure that the pigs would dig around, they would stir it into the soil and just watching what they did, I realized how much power they had to bring organic matter back to the soil. 
So after two years of running them through this whole area, we had built over about six inches of topsoil. If anybody has studied ecology in college, we know that in natural ecosystems, one inch of topsoil is built in about a thousand years in nature. So we thought that was pretty cool. During that same time period, I had been developing a water management strategy for this property that included earthworks, shaping the land to collect and store water. And I had this inspiration and this vision that if we were able to establish trees, that they could anchor an ecosystem that would continue to upgrade. Uh, one of my mentors is a man named Mark Shepard that does work in Wisconsin and now all, all, all over the country using a model called restoration agriculture. And that's a model that I took and kind of adapted to this climate. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, once we had built the topsoil, we decided to use contour swales to divide these fields. So there are three swales where we planted trees within. What's First a swale? Contour swale is a level ditch on contour that is designed to store and distribute water. And so the way I saw it, the swales could also create soil habitat, soil um, conditions where trees would be able to establish with low amounts of water. And so again, we planted the trees in the contour swales, dividing the fields. Uh, so there's one, two, three contour swales in between the three crop fields. Um, and the trees are a mix of apple and pear and some other native shrubs, uh, fruiting shrubs, and then nitrogen fixing shrubs in between each fruiting tree to feed the fruiting trees. Um, the trees also act as these um, habitat buffers. They are windbreaks, they are habitat for insects and birds, and just create this uh, moisture microclimate. Uh, and then we began planting the crops. So we, began, we got seeds originally from Rich Pecoraro at Masa Seed Foundation, another friend of mine, and just asked him, I wanna start growing crops without a lot of irrigation. What are the best crops that you have? At that point, he gave me seeds, um, Chihuahua blue corn, uh, sorghum from Africa. So that's the only non-bioregional crop that we grow in the crop fields. And then a couple kinds of amaranth and a couple different kinds of dry beans. And we tested a couple of them and landed on Hopi black and scarlet amaranth and golden giant amaranth. So again, when we first planted the fields, the crops would start off pretty small. We were just collecting seed from whatever plants uh, set seed. You know, they were in low water conditions from the beginning. And just through that simple process of selection uh, over and over each year, we developed seeds that could grow in these very limited water conditions. Um, so this year, the corn has actually been the hardest crop uh, ever here. Last year, it was like eight feet <clears throat> tall. So and just for, know. yeah, just for perspective too, we gleaned about 350 pounds of grain from these three fields all planted by hand, all harvested by hand. And then a lot of the regenerative systems design that we are demonstrating here involves the integration of the crop or the crops with the livestock systems. So once the crops come down in the fall, we send the pigs through, the pigs clear the fields, they eat the rest of the crop residue. <laughs> and they and love leave. it. <laughs> <laughs> they have a blast. <laughs> this is also where we breed them. So the moms and the, and the boar come and have a good old time over here too. They can hide behind the stocks. <laughs> 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 yeah. And so then once the pigs have cleared the fields and just left their fertility in the fields, we bring a ch chickens in, uh, egg laying chickens, and they continue to spread and spread the manure around and also fertilize with different macronutrients. And then after that, we leave the fields and that's just how they're prepped and prepared. So no tractor work at all. Then in the spring, they are till, uh, were plowed, I should say, by hand with a pickaxe to plant the seeds in the furrows and then we usually have enough water to irrigate a couple times a week until about june and again this year has been one of the driest it was the driest spring ever, i've ever been here um so again they're kind of established with rainwater in the spring a little bit of irrigation and then gone dry lands after that um, and what's really cool is like we might not get a lot of food from the corn this year although the sorghum and amaranth and dry beans all did really well but whatever corn we do get this year will be the best seed crop that we've gleaned so far because of how it could set seed in the tough conditions that we had this year. Why is it the best seed if it's the smallest it's ever been? Well, it's the most drought tolerant, it's the most vigorous in these conditions. Mm -hmm.
Di Domenico here from Drylands Agroecology Research and Elk Run Farm. So Nick, why is healthy soil so important? Healthy soil is so important because healthy soil is the living membrane that connects the photosynthetic parts of all vegetation, trees, grasses, and shrubs to the source of all their nutrition and building blocks, water, and nutrients on earth. It's what connects the living, growing world in the, in the light of the sun with the growing and decaying world below the ground. Healthy soil is the vector that makes all life processes possible on planet Earth. What does it mean to be a steward of the soil? Of the soil is somebody with the heart and the awareness to orchestrate the symphony of life above ground that echoes the health below ground. I think our job as land stewards and stewards of the soil is to mimic nature and nature's processes so that the soil can do what it does best, support all of life on planet Earth. So we can do that by building healthy ecosystems and stewarding them as humans have always done, being participants in the ecological systems that surround us. Can healthy soil help us as we face the climate crisis? So how can healthy soil help us in the face of climate crisis? Healthy soil is what grows all plants and food crops and very importantly stores carbon and water, the two most important greenhouse gases that are currently warming our planet. Healthy soil sequesters carbon in the soil which then in turn holds water in the ground. These processes are deeply connected and both are incredibly important. Healthy soil also has abundant microbiology and fungal networks that are the communicative forces between all life below ground. How can individuals support healthy soil in their own homes and communities? Everyone worldwide can be stewards of the soil by understanding and taking accountability for all of our actions and consumptions. We can limit or eliminate our chemical use in household products, removing fertilizers and chemical treatments from our land steward practices. These harsh chemicals kill what is living in the soil and destroy that network of communication. We can all become stewards again, even if that means the small tree outside of our apartment complex or the landscape around our homes. The earth and natural ecosystems need us to again feel the belonging that comes from loving and enjoying nature and taking care of it as we would our own body. We are all being called at this time to return to reciprocity and relationship with the natural world, and this will be beautifully unique for each person. My encouragement, this relationship begins with gratitude. Healthy soil and all of nature is what gives us life every single day. Thank you so much for joining me as we spoke with those three community partners today about the importance of soil health. I think we learned a lot about how everyone around the world can be a steward of the soil by focusing on giving more than they take, reconnecting with Mother Earth, and ultimately coming from a place of gratitude. Gratitude for our Earth, gratitude for all she does for us, and gratitude for each and every one of us who is a steward of the soil. Speaking of gratitude, thank you to all of our community partners who joined us today to explore the roots of soil health here in Colorado. First, thank you to Clark with Mad Agriculture for sharing his perspective and his journey from soil scientist to true soil steward. If you'd like to learn more about Mad Agriculture and their work, please check out their website, madagriculture.org. And thank you to Andrea and Beverly with Harvest of All First Nations for sharing their knowledge perspective and wisdom with us today about the true foundations of soil health and what it means to live in harmony with the earth. 
If you'd like to learn more about Hoffman and their programs, please check out their website, hoffinco.org. And of course, thank you to Nick and Marissa with Drylands Agroecology Research. If you'd like to learn more about the work Nick and Marissa are doing to revitalize our drylands, please check out www.dar.eco. And of course, my name is Jolie Bronner, and I am the director for the Coalition for a Regenerative Future with the Alliance Center, soon to be the Alliance for Collective Action. If you're interested in learning more about us, please check out our website. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you have a very happy Earth Day.